Scott, we need to talk. Okay, this is live life better. That's right. Get down. Get down again. Get to the chopper. Get to the chopper now. We are living it better. In this episode, we have Tanner Faust. That is right. He is a badass race car driver. If you don't know who he is, he is he's pretty much done everything in racing. Um, and his accolades speak for themselves. Check him out. We also have Matt Farah pop on. He is a boss, boss man, Matt Farah, with the smoking tire, if you don't know him. Uh, also, he's a car and driver a ton, He is right? a automotive journalist. He works with Road and Track, and Road and Track. I also produce his podcast, The Smoking Tire, so the check that shit out. Smoking Tire. Um, anyways, super fun podcast. We talk about uh, everything automotive and awesome. Oh, yeah. Ooh, ah, ah. Ooh, chakalaka. <laughs> Welcome to Live Life Better. This is Scott Eastwood. I want you to live the best version of your life. We're all human beings. We're all just trying to figure it out. Find something you love and chase it. We are live. Mm. Tanner Faust, what is going Ow. on? You thank know. you. Thank you today for coming in, by the way. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome. You got a little cool digs here. Yeah. So I camped out and lounge. Uh, I mean, you're probably not in town very often, frankly. Uh, I'm I live like a nomad. Yeah. Fair. I'm like here, I'm there, I'm everywhere. I come into town, I do some podcasts. We knock it out. Are you, do you still ever go back to Monterey? Um, I go back. Yeah. Uh, not a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you up there for Laguna Seca? I or was what there, you up there for? yesterday. Really? Yeah, my mom lives up there. And that's where I went to elementary school. Was I Foothill? Was it Foothill Elementary? Did you really? Yep. Wow. And so I went up there and uh, yeah, it's Mother's Day. So yeah, yeah, it's cool. Mother's Day, got to do it. Mother's Day is awesome. Uh, so people who don't know you, um, you are known very well in the car world. Um, rally car racer, uh, drift, ice racing, time attack, uh, pretty much done it all. Uh, I would say your accolades in the sport are of the highest. Um, how? Why? Um, I have no freaking clue. I, I don't know how, I, honestly. Well, let's start at the beginning. Well, I mean, I, don't, I didn't come from a racing family, right? So okay. um, my parents never went to a race. I, I didn't go-kart or you know do any of that stuff <laughs> sure. growing up. Um, I was just a, a car fan. Like I remember, I think when I was six, I could name any car by its headlights. That was like a family trick. No you know, way. Played and like and in the in the rearview mirror. Uh, well, you'd anything, look at them. Anything. I okay. just look around. My sister was absolutely exhausted by it. She hated <laughs> it. But I pointed out and and um, but it was a uh, you know cars were always a passion and you know I had the poster of the white Lamborghini Countach and you know every every that was sort of the kids thing to mm -hmm. do. It was never really a job potentially um, until I was older. Till I was in college. And, you know, I was studying to be a doctor. I, at first, I was studying to be an aerospace engineer, which I loved the idea of being that guy holding the little wand with the smoke. Okay. And that the, where the aerodynamic, you know, I guess. Hydrofoil. Yeah, or yeah. And, over. And, you, and you're designing rear view mirrors to be more aerodynamic or quieter or whatever. I don't know. Um, but those jobs didn't really seem to exist when I was in engineering school. And I skied like 50 days my first semester. So that didn't work out either. This is, this is in Colorado? <laughs> Uh, this is in Boulder, yeah. Boulder. Yeah, in Boulder. And then I, I ended up just getting, uh, um, I started working for an inventor who invented amusement rides. No ways. And he was, uh, you know, you get, it's like addicting when you when you hang out with somebody that just does what they think is fun mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And then they get paid for it. And you're like, how in the hell do I do that? <laughs> and and for me, it was either skiing or driving. Those are my two, the, the, that's like, that scratched the itch. Really? And so I, I've I've found uh, I was literally coming back from this inventor. I just moved to Florida. I just was coming back in Colorado. Saw this racetrack from the airplane, and it was called Second Creek Raceway. It was in Denver, and I just I followed the roads from the airplane as we were coming into land to see how to get there. Drove there, and a guy that I met there I ended up working volunteering on his race team as a mechanic in return for seat time in his cars. Okay. 
And uh, you met him there. Met him there. I was just standing at the racetrack, and he's like, "Hey, bro, you can't stand so close to the track." And and then we like <laughs> struck up a conversation. Uh-huh. And he owned a race team, and I was a terrible mechanic. He always said, uh, "You know, just do it fast enough so you have time to do it over again after you fuck it up." So okay. it was like that one of those sort of things. But it was. Um, you know, I got eight months. I worked as a mechanic, and then I got enough seat time to to get a license and to do a race. Okay, and, and then the hook was in. So to get a license, you, when you say that, you have to get a special racing license that allows you to compete in these events. Yeah, the like the the normal route that people go in at first is is SCCA, which okay. is Sports Car Club of America, I think is what it is, and it used to be kind of the big deal. Now it's kind of club racing. And, um, yeah, so I drove these generic slow-ass cars called Spec Ford Racers mm-hmm. that had literally, this is sounds so anticlimactic, they have uh, literally had a 1.9 liter Pinto engine in them. <laughs> they had 100 horsepower. They are like, all set at the same power, but then there was, like, a really lightweight tube frame chassis. Okay. And so it's actually good training because the, the cars are identical, like, absolutely sure. identical. And so it was all about momentum, and it was all those things that you kind of have to really work at to get the last 10% out of the car. And so it was good practice. So, so I, I sort of, from that point, kind of, if I qualified well in a race, first I found this old guy who would, who, who gave me 10 races for 3,500 bucks, which was a great deal. So I spent basically everything I had on that. And then you have to pay to enter these races Yes, okay. and tires and you know, sure. It's a pay to play kind of a thing. At you that have level. to buy the car as well. Uh, just you essentially rent it. Yeah, the Pinto. Uh-huh. <laughs> You bought a Pinto. Yeah. Yeah, it was white. And um, (laughs) so, you know, you get in there, and and, uh, if I qualified, say, third, I would go to the guys that I had um, beaten in qualifying. They're all, you know, business owners or doctors or whatever, and um, would say that I had, like, a coaching service and, and... that I, because this is before cameras, you know, GoPros and things like that attached to every car. This is cir- circa with. day what? This is uh, late 90s. Okay. And so you're, um, you needed somebody out on the track to tell you what was going on. You couldn't just watch your own data at that level. Yep. And so it was, a, I charged a couple hundred bucks a person and, and then I'd get enough out of those guys to pay for that day. And I did that for a number of years and, um, and just sort of, you know, things just sort of snowballed here and there and, and it's always just been a fun and a business Mm -hmm. and, um, been super lucky to, to tap into like a bunch of different disciplines off road and, um, rally racing and drifting and, you know, just a, a fun variety, frankly. So you start Let's call it the Pinto division, right? Because I like that. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> so you start in the Pinto division. Yeah. And then is there any real money in that division? Oh, I mean, yeah. If you win? Oh, yeah. You're beating the girls off with a stick. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's it's the lifestyle. We got the Pintos running door to door. No, it, I mean, you. I can't remember really how it, how it all kind of, what the exact numbers were. But it was, it was uh, everybody's there paying. There's you're, no, there's no prize money. There's no. You're lucky. Um, you're, you're 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 doing well if you break even. Yeah, it, it's it's guys that are it, it's like guys that that wanted to maybe be a racer growing up, and yep. they went down the road. They ran the family business. They were doctors. They did you know whatever. And then as they were older, they're like, oh okay, I can peel off a little bit here, and I can go race on the weekends. They're weekend warriors. So and, were you were you working another job at the same time? Uh, at the same time, at uh, that point, yeah, I, I was, I was uh, doing, uh, I was working for, so when the inventor moved to Florida, I got a job at Pikes Peak International Raceway, okay. selling sponsorship for the track. Okay. And so- You're a salesman. I was trying to be. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but, uh, so it, it was, um, so I had that going on, and then I was doing the, the racing with the SCCA, and then- and the winter, I got one of the guys at these races uh, ran a winter driving school in mm-hmm. Steamboat. And so in the winter, I went up there and I was an instructor on the at the ice driving school. And that's where the car control hook, you know, sliding around and being sideways all the time. That's where that ran deep. That's when you got, you were like, this is fun. I like that's, this. This is my living. That's yeah. when I was like, I don't care. I'm I'm done doing whatever. I'm Do just what you love. slide around. Love it. Yeah. It was, uh, and, and you know, it, it's only for the winter. It's only three months a year. Okay. But I mean, there's nothing like driving on ice. It's just the most fun thing ever. I mean, obviously, if you're not like crashing in, in traffic and stuff, but sure. it's, uh, but just car control was really something that I, um, it, it, and it's not like a, a natural 
thing or anything. It's just something that I love to learn. Sure. And and just I couldn't. There weren't enough hours in the day. I I, wow. I could have just been sliding around and driving all the time, and uh, constantly learning more. And that's you know that 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 feeling is a great feeling. Okay, so you're you're teaching ice car control more yep. or less. Yep. And you're also in this Pinto division, and <laughs> you you do really you're doing well in it, right? Yep. What's the next step to get to the big leagues? So then, so this is a question I get asked actually sometimes from from young guys that are getting guys. in, yeah, sure. and 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 it's um, it's a tough. There's a there's a barrier there of, mm -hmm. and it's generally, unfortunately, and not glamorously, money. That's that's a bit of a barrier because uh, racing's expensive, and yep. to get going in, you got to start with something. Um, for me, I didn't have that, and I and I did find a way through those walls. And um, I think it's a matter of being a bit opportunistic. Um, for me, it was, and, and it's different for everybody, so I can't, there's no formula, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see. For me, it was that uh, I was doing this industry, this thing called ride and drives in the summers when I stopped racing the Pinto League. And uh, the I was doing ice driving the winters, this ride and drive industry in the summers, which is like marketing driving events, and just kind of cutting teeth on uh, different types of, of coaching. Essentially, you're a coach. And then I got into uh, I, rally racing. So the Pinto Racing League, which is a spec Ford racer, was uh, road racing. Okay. And so that's like on normal racetracks. Mm -hmm. Rally racing's out in the forest, and it's in Europe. It's like uh, the second most popular motorsport in the world. These crazy freaking fans go camp out for days while cars drive by like one minute at a time or one at a time. Um, it's just not popular in the U.S. Yeah. I love it. I think it's awesome. It is bitching. Yeah. And um, the, like the drives I respect most in the world are rally racers pretty much. But it, it it's something that the barrier to get in was pretty low because it's not a big sport in the U.S. Okay. With cheap, cheaper car too? Can you get in with it? You can get in with a cheaper car. There's not a huge level in order to be kind of at the top of that industry. It doesn't take much. Okay. And so- In terms of what? Um, it doesn't take much in terms of talent? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe in terms of car, talent, team, money, all that stuff. Yeah. Because the industry's kind of small, you know. Um, it's kind of like you know going to be the top drag racer in England wouldn't be as big a deal as being the top drag racer here in the U.S. Got it. So the uh, it got got in there. I I had a friend who was a manager of a Subaru dealership. His wife thought he looked good in a driving suit that covered sponsorship for a while, uh -huh. and so we we went rally racing and. Then kind of then drifting came to the U.S. and honestly, that's where it turned over for me. Um, drifting, this weird, unassuming sport from Japan, born in the hills of Japan. You know, there's a, uh -huh. there's a, sure <laughs> the whole thing. And um, at that point, I was kind of getting into some movies driving. I'd done Dukes of Hazard um, as a stunt car driver. As a stunt car driver, mm -hmm. and I was Billy Prickett, and I got to who's the bad guy. I got to drive the General Lee for a while, which is a dream come true. Um, Tokyo Drift came around with uh, Fast and Furious, which was one of the most fun movies ever to work on. And um, so drifting hit, and then that was when. And for um, people who don't know who's listening right now, who like, what the hell is drifting? Right. What is drifting? Drifting, I mean, you have incredibly high horsepower cars that are rear wheel drive. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen a car do like a power slide or a skid, that would technically be a drift. But then you take that to the extreme where these cars are going 100 miles an hour. And then it's a competitive format. One car is chasing the other car, has to be as close as possible, match everything they do, and then they swap. And then there are judges that determine which one wins. Got it. That's the basics of it. The actual car control factor is unbelievable. Like it's an incredibly committed. Uh, I mean, I've got so less, so many lessons out of drifting. It's it's crazy. I've never been more nervous. No, um, for people who haven't who haven't gone to one of these events, it's totally high adrenaline it's awesome to see yeah. um they have one down in long beach every year right that, yeah that's the big one yeah they have the one long, in, beach, in long beach there's uh, still formula drift is still the series in the u.s sure at that time and um, this is circa 2004 mm -hmm. uh drifting was really just in japan and was just coming to the u.s here um now it's bigger in the u.s than anywhere in the world and it's um it's an amazing sport but it's not the same as like a motorsport. 
it's more of a lifestyle event. Like mm-hmm. you said, it's super high adrenaline. Everybody's in There's a band. You know, there's always DJs going. There's always car shows. So the marketing departments of these companies get involved, not just the racing departments. And in the world of what makes the racing world go around, racing budgets are really small. Marketing budgets are huge. Sure. So learn really quickly to get on top of that industry as fast as possible. Get to know all the marketing and understand the business of what makes a um, what what makes a, a change of perception of a company. Like with drifting, you can literally change the perception of the company image mm-hmm. rather than just a sticker on a card going around a track. Okay. And uh, is a fast. I was fascinated with the business side of it, but uh, so I started doing the drifting. Won the championship a couple times. Um, got involved with Papadakis Racing, who's still leading the championship, I think, now with his current driver. And um, so at that point, you know, you kind of get on top of this pyramid of a motorsport rally or drifting. Then you really help to try to build the pyramid as big as you can. And then you're still like on top. And then uh, from drifting moved to I had done that for eight years. It was an amazing ride. Uh, is, 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 is dr- how dangerous is drifting? Drifting. In the in the sport of it, you know, I mean, I, I it's I'm sure that's a that's a pretty general question. If you're doing it around some cliff road, it could be pretty dangerous. But actually driving, you doing it in the in the Formula D circuit, uh, drifting's pretty damn dangerous. I think when you come from rally racing, where you're out in the forest, mm-hmm. it, it drifting is not quite as dangerous as rally that. racing is more dangerous. I think so, and um, a lot of it. You know, the, the problem with rally racing is you're in the forest, so if you crash into a tree, there's not like a safety truck that's just going to sure. pull up. You they know? might not even know about you for a long An time. hour, yeah. right? More. Yeah. yeah. I, I did have a crash rally racing. I dropped off a 30-foot drop, lawn darted into another hill, and, it, you know, with all the harnesses and everything on, still broke my helmet on the gear shift. Jeez. Just there's that much stretch in stuff. Yeah. And, you know, you're just laying there waving at a helicopter waiting for somebody to get you. Um, but this uh, is this is with another person in the car, right? Yeah, your navigator. Yeah, exactly. And so they have to go through. Yeah, you know, you punish them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the navigators are a different breed. I mean, they they just do it without having control. It's insane. Uh, Amazing. So yeah. wait, hold on. Let's go back to this crash really quick, is because was this the only crash you had in in rally racing, or have you had several? Oh, lots. Yeah, lots. Was this, this was the, the worst? One. Yeah, this is the biggest one I had. This is the last time I ever have driven without something called a Hans device. Okay. Which is a head and neck restraint device. Okay. Um, and so you it was just up to your neck to stop your head from coming off. Where now there's a you know a whole system connected to the belts that keeps your head uh, kind of mobilized. Yeah, you know, you you couldn't touch like your chin to your chest, kind of a thing. It keeps the neck from flexing that that way. And after that, you were like, no, no more. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, we, we bounced off this road. And the problem with rally racing, okay, so you're on these cliff edges, and all you're doing is focusing just on the road, and you don't even realize there's a cliff until you make a mistake, Jeez. and then you're just like, holy shit, we're tumbling down. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, lovely. And, yeah, so it was a, a fairly good hit. My co-driver was okay. Um, which is, you know, your main cod, the guilt factor, the main concern when you get in a crash, even if you're in the street and you get in a crash, yeah. your main concern is like, oh my gosh, I just completely messed up this buddy of mine or whatever. But, um, no, everybody was good. We rolled down the hill and, and made Survived. It. Yeah. yeah. So my, I still have like a little bit of a neck issue from that Ooh. crash. It sticks with you. you know? How, no, I mean, annually, are there people dying every year? Do people die? anymore people, is it changed people die in rally racing for sure the safety that's a that's one of the great things about rally racing is because it's so dangerous they re uh ev- they evolved through the safety features of these cars you know the the roll cage technology and that head and neck restraint system and the the how lightweight the helmets are and and it goes on and on the fire suppression stuff all of that really gets developed around crazy ass sports like rally racing so sure. it's I mean, if you look at world rally racing, which is the the big uh, version of the sport, the limits that they're pushing in the speeds and everything—it's incredible that people aren't dying every event. Wow! But it's uh, but they they you know it does happen every so often, but it takes a big one to do it. Okay. And now back to drift. It, 
do people die in that? Do people get hurt? Um, there are people that sometimes get hurt in drifting. And the safety, the the thing with drifting is it was a little behind on the safety factor. Okay. You know, it's it kind of guys putting together an S15 Nissan and, you know, maybe not a fuel cell or maybe not a lot of safety stuff and coming out and there's still real concrete walls to hit. Mm -hmm. And the commitment in drifting, I mean, when you're sitting there for qualifying, uh, say at, at Irwindale, which is, you know, here in LA, the guy, I think they're doing it for one more year. And uh, you're going to be going 95 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour along the wall. You have to have the back bumper basically touching the wall uh, around the oval, which is a three-eighths mile oval or whatever. That's sliding around for people who don't know yeah, what he's talking about. You're sliding sideways. Back <coughs> bumper is grazing the wall at faster than highway speeds. Yep. And then you have to do this transition on the front straightaway and then have your car come at another wall. It's... It, it, the closer you come to crashing and really messing yourself up, the better your score. And so is there, and there's 15,000 people there shaking the building and you just have to like go just a little bit more than you're comfortable with every single time. Mm -hmm. And so the nerves there, it's a great, it's a great way to practice dealing with nerves, frankly, because you, you get to, uh, you, you have to convince yourself that those sort of nerves are going to make you better. Mm. And they have the tools in your bag, no matter what happens, the visceral like nature of it, it's going to work out. And um, it, it takes a lot of confidence. And I think it's a it's a great sport for like mental training, mm. even though the physical part of it's important. You know, would you consider yourself uh, an adrenaline junkie? I you know, it's a tough question because I like things that are exciting and fun. But the. uh the, f the fact is, is that once the adrenaline kicks in, you crash. Hmm. Like if you actually let the adrenaline drop into the blood, you crash. Because then the natural instincts of being a human and chasing wildebeest, you know, around and and climbing trees or whatever we uh, did in the past, those instincts come to the surface, not driving instincts. They're all, almost all the natural instincts are bad for driving. Really? Yeah. Virtually everyone. Where you have to push away that sort of fight or flight yes exactly oh. you're it's a constant and you'll notice racers are constantly um controlling adrenaline and controlling that visceral level so that they can apply technique instead of natural instinct because the instincts they crash you look at the wrong stuff you always you know you look at the the back of the bus that you don't want to hit on the highway and mm -hmm. smash into it you know there's all these things they say on road driving where like they'll they'll have like an exit ramp on a highway and they'll have one tree out there and everybody always crashes into the tree. And so they move the tree and then everybody still crashes into the tree. <laughs> and so that's just like, you know, you go where you look like any sport. There's yep. certain rules that the body follows and training where to look your eyes, where to put your eyes is, is pretty hard. You have kids, right? You have yeah, a kid. I have one daughter. Yeah. One, one daughter. Does that affect how you were in your, you know, your early race career? And how you think about danger, living your life sort of on the edge. Does that ever come into your thought process? Uh, it does. Uh, it mm, more travel. More, more. It, it's with travel. Being it, away. Yeah, it's it's just being out of town. Yeah. And um, you know, there was a phase when I got into this marketing stuff with drifting. Uh, you, you know, you tap into that world and and then you start to go into other marketing areas. And I got into the marketing side of stunts and spec, you know, spectacles like with Hot Wheels. And so Hot Wheels uh, had this big campaign. It was going to be toys for real. And they're mm -hmm. like, OK, our first generation or, our, you know, whatever this generation of, of toy owners are grown up now and they have kids. So we need to get the grown ups excited. So we're going to take the toy that everybody played with as a kid, this big jump. Yep. And then we're going to do it for real. And we're going to break like a world record thing. We're going to have a big orange track. And, um, you know, you, 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 you talk about these things, you go and you have some drinks with some friends and you're talking, you're drawn out on a napkin. Ooh, it'd be super cool if we did this. And, and then before you know it, uh, you're actually doing it. And then you're like, Oh crap. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you, you look at the ramp for the first time and that's when you start thinking, well, I got a kid, you know, I don't know like if I want to be. <laughs> and you're, you, did you guys do this? We this did is, it. Where'd you guys do this? We did it. The Indy 500. We did, uh, the hundredth running of the Indy 500. We mm -hmm. did. Uh, it, you, I don't know if you remember this Hot Wheels toy. I think it was called the V Drop. 
the big ramp where you like boost off exactly. of it. Exactly. Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so you, it like starts on top of a door yeah. kind of a thing, and that's where it gets all its speed. And so they built a hundred foot door, and then we put a little truck on top of this door, and then an orange ramp, and went down, and then jumped three hundred and thirty two feet. Three hundred and thirty two feet in the air. Do you have? Pay- oh my gosh. Yeah, that's the view from the. Uh, is that you in the car driving? Yes, it is. Oh <laughs> my god! How fast? When you hit the, uh, you right. had to hit it at a hundred to clear the gap, and anything over a hundred and five was a world record. How do you how who how how do you know that? Does someone is there science that goes into that? They go okay if you're traveling this with this much weight. Is yeah, it all- some pimply faced engineer just out of school <laughs> comes and says, "Hey, bro, you're gonna be totally fine as long as trust you go a hundred. Yeah, no exactly. way. Yeah." And you know we did we with this particular one we did a couple Hot Wheel stunts with the with this one we were um, Jesus, we did fifty jumps and ten of them were world records and they were like on the money every time that they said if you go this speed you jump this far and they completely nailed it. Okay, is that coming off the ramp like pretty much? Yeah, that's coming off the ramp, right? And so when you're in the air, you uh, you know the the truck either goes nose up or nose down. You don't have control over that? You can a little bit with the brakes. So you get one hit on the brakes. Like just before you go? Uh, if you if you launch and the clouds are not going up in your view, so the nose isn't pitching over, mm-hmm. then you get on the brakes. And then that rotates the truck forward, kind of like a dirt bike. Okay. Yeah, all that spinning. Can you spinning. hit the gas and get it back or no? A little bit. It's like hard, but you're all you're already kind of tapped out on the top speed with the gas, so you don't really have much more. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the uh, if you had another gear, you could do it, but it was a sketchy thing if the wind got underneath the front of the truck because then it would backflip it, and that was sort of worst case scenario, which the guy trying to break the record did. He backflipped it. There was there was one guy who front flipped it and crashed and didn't break it, and then a couple years ago, named a guy named Bryce Menzies uh, did break it. And then tried to go bigger and backflipped it and hurt himself really bad. Jeez. But that was a so you get into these marketing things and then before you know it, the you know the budgets or whatever happens, the scale just gets huge. Sure. And then you start thinking about, you know, do I really want to keep doing that kind of stuff? And and mm-hmm. the answer was, we got away from the jump clean. It was awesome. Uh, you know, Hot Wheels was so committed. It was incredible. I mean, they had like 250 people at the at the uh, event 300,000 people were there watching and mm-hmm. and it was right before gentlemen start your engines and then they decided they wanted to do a loop and do a world record loop okay um and they wanted to do two cars in the loop it was six stories high and again the whole concept you know if like okay there's going to be a car upside down six stories up uh it didn't seem like a good idea at the time <laughs> and but it it that one worked out as well, and they, you know, they got like two billion media impressions or something in two Shh. weeks. Are you just staring at the black line and mashing the pedal? Oh my God! So okay, I mean, obviously, if you're listening, you can't this see this. This is but insane, by the way. I put, mean, this is every kid's what you played with. Yeah, but this is for real. Yeah, it's a. <laughs> it, it was a. It was a bit of a freak show kind of thing to get in there and be on the orange track. Yeah, like just that whole. I spent a lot of time with Hot Wheels. So was, yeah. But yeah, so you see those two white marks on the top. So at when you're upside down, you kind of wanted to know when you were upside down on the loop so that you could slow down a bit. So you, you need when you slow down at the top? Yeah, just so you didn't have to do the full G-force hit at the bottom. Okay. So the car had it took 6.8 Gs uh when you first hit the loop and then it would go to like 1 G at the top ideally and then another 6.8 at the bottom and is a lot so um, you'd slow down when you saw those white ticks. We practiced three times before ever even seeing the white um, marks because your your eyeballs, when you first hit, your eyeballs are like kind of going different directions. And you're, Sure. Yeah, you're just Your not, equilibrium's like never done that in a car before, right? It's just the, we went up in a plane and felt six or seven Gs and, and tried to get used to it, but you just don't, I, I mean, yeah. it's huge respect for fighter pilots and stuff that just pump that stuff out all the you know right off the deck every morning yeah it's it's really hard on the body but um yeah so then uh greg tracy is the other driver there we rochambeaued he was the green driver i was the yellow we rock paper scissors to see who got to try it out first he uh 
can't remember if he won or lost, but he went first. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, <laughs> that meant that on the day he got to win. Um, it was a, it, those were fun events, but you know, you ask yourself if you would do it again, you know what, now that you know, your kids are kind of older or whatever, my daughter's a little older. So like how dangerous is going through that? I mean, you, if you miss and you come off of it and you come upside down, are you probably going to die? Yeah, I mean, you're, it's like dropping six upside down drop. from six stories. You're done That's for sure. Just crazy. You're not. You're just not going to walk away. We we sort of. It's kind of weird in those things, and it's 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 like film stunts too. Mm -hmm. The driver has a lot to do with the comfort level of what they need to see safety wise sure. in order to just do it because it's you're doing something that's unprecedented yeah and in a movie they'll be like so do you think we need a barrier here or do you think we can get away without it you know and the driver will say no nah, we're good you know it's that it's that kind of mm -hmm. you take responsibility and in this one we kind of asked that they do a practice run with a non-manned you know remote control car Really? So they built a full-size car. It was uh, built also out of a Mitsubishi Evo, just like the other ones, which incidentally, that car was the first car I ever owned, was that Evo that got turned into that okay. Hot Wheels car. Um, they uh, built they built this full-size thing. Dude goes in there, you know, they get like a world champion remote control car guy out there, and everybody's standing around this giant structure at El Toro uh, Marine Base where the practice area was set up, and fiery ball crash tires bouncing oh, away no. from the scene like just the gnarliest thing <laughs> oh my Greg god Greg and I are just looking at each other like holy shit what did we get into and uh yeah that's did when the rock paper scissors wrong? did he 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 kind of there was a little safety rail uh halfway up there he bounced and that lost enough speed that it just dropped out of the sky oh, <laughs> oh my god <laughs> just landed. that'll do wonders for your confident confidence huh? then they built a net you can see in that one down in the lower picture there's actually if you look at some of the pictures there's a net up oh, there oh yeah for the practice so if it does drop you'd land in the net the practice run for that that net bounced once and then the they disconnected and then the thing crashed down to the ground again. <laughs> this was again in the second time the remote control yeah. uh, well, car. Um, that one was it was a real driver. No, that one was not a real driver. That was a remote control car. That was a second time they built it enough to put it back together just to run it, and dropped it into the net. Oh, you know what they did? No, they actually craned it up there and just dropped it into the net. Oh, just it was after it, it had been crashed. So they just craned the wreckage up and then <laughs> let it go to see if the net would hold it. I didn't. What kind of like physical conditioning? I mean, that's this can be a broader question as well. You were saying before that like kids ask you how how they can get into it, and no path is ever the same. But a lot of the human aspects, I'm sure, are the same. I mean, there's a lot of fear that you deal with. There's adversity. There's all kinds of different things. Physical conditioning. Yeah. I mean, I, if you're taking six G's, this in particular, did they give you training in particular? Uh, we went um, to like a flight school up in the desert in California and they put you in these aerobatic planes called extras and they do these spiraling dives where you can just hold G's for a long time because like a fighter jet can hold G's for a long time but they have crazy power. Most planes can't do that so you have to dive while you're spiraling in order to keep the G's and um, then you'd, you'd get a feeling for how terrible you were at holding G's frankly. You know you watch it. You watch it on the movies or whatever, and they get in those little centrifugal things, and their face gets plastered sure. back, and they black out. I think my dad did one in Space Cowboys. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Lee Jones Just drooling all over yourself, <laughs> yeah. like right away. <laughs> um, and so it's uh, there's. I mean, I'm also thinking of the one where Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd are doing it. Yeah. I can't remember the movie, but. Um, Spies like Spies us. Spies like us. Uh, yeah. so, yes. fucking so good. <laughs> but you, you know, it's the it's the speed at which you take the G. It's the zero to four G will knock you out just because you know you're you're, you're like a, a water balloon, like a long water balloon. It'll just flow all the blood down to your feet so fast. Wow. So the process for this to go zero to six point eight instantly was, as you're going down the straightaway, you'd go first gear, second gear. We had the rev limit locked so that in second gear you're at the right speed which was 52 and a half miles an hour same little really that's engineer. It, 52 I, I called bullshit right away <laughs> i was like no uh, no way seem right. like 100 <laughs> the the hell? that's why greg and i were like yeah get a remote control car up there uh -huh. there's no way but uh 52 and a half and then you had this like hand throttle that you lock out 
and so that if your foot slips off the pedal, it stays full throttle. Got it. And then you'd grab the wheel at the bottom of the wheel so that if one hand slipped off, it wouldn't turn it. And then just start crimping from your feet to your calves and quads and butt and gut and just start pushing all the blood up into your head as hard as you could. And then just sit your your head back in the seat and wait for Why it. Why do you have to crimp and do just, what you said? You've got to get all that blood that? into your brain so when you hit the Gs, you, the blood just doesn't drain out of your brain and you black out. And it, and it and just that, happens. And that quick, because you're, you're, it's not like you're easing into those Gs, it's, right? It's, it looks like you're driving into a wall. It just goes straight from normal, having a good Sunday, to, <laughs> to 6.8 Fuck my G. Life. <laughs> exactly. Here we go, upside down. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Now, it was a good experience, and, and you know, walking away from it is a good experience. I don't know if we'd do it again, but uh, that that was a that was pushing the whole marketing side of things sure. to, the, to the limit. Sure. So now you 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 say that you know you think a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. uh, there's, you know, to to Tim to your, to your point, it's like um, there is, I think, a mentality there of risk management, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that that does start to fill in a little bit more having kids and and getting a little bit older. But um, you also don't want to, you don't want somebody else to do it. Like you sure. still, you still you want to be on do top. it totally. Yeah, of course, so you still want to go get it. And there's, um, but there, there from a, the physical side of it, there's the baseline physical ability, and um, which is connected to that mental ability. You know, being able to suppress the adrenaline, being able to make the right decisions instead of natural instinct doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're in shape enough that you're not, uh, you, you know, it's like heat training. If you're if you're able to deal with the heat and the heat doesn't like stress you out, then you have a better chance of making the right call in the moment. Got it. Yeah. Now you do a lot of uh, work in movies still. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Are you kind of the go-to guy for certain drifting and certain you know certain stuff? There was a small crew that filled that, checked that box. It's kind of expanding now. Some of the guys that have been in drifting for a while have started to get you know their their SAG card and started to get involved a little bit more. Got it. Um, but what, what was the last movie you worked on? Uh. The last movie I worked on was, um, I, it was a, it was a title. It was still in progress. It was a doubling Brad Pitt in a movie on a moon. Uh, it was called a <laughs> movie on a moon. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what the, um, they had a couple working titles, Sure, but we shot out at Dumont Dunes and, uh, they had this cool lens that, that made everything look like it was, you know, the sky was black instead of blue and, oh, cool. and the moon and they, they had the frame rate exactly right. So it was like 14% less gravity or something. So every bit of sand and every jump that you did in these rovers was bitching. I mean, it literally, you'd look at it right there and it looked like it was on the moon. That's awesome. Yeah. It was really, I really cool. I want to see that movie. Yeah, me too. Um, I think it's a ways out, but yeah, so that, that was the last one. And okay. so some of the guys like Reese Millen is a guy that I did Dukes of Hazard with and Tokyo Drift and a number of other movies is kind of good guy, bad guy pairs. Um, he now builds cars for movies. So he built those rovers out of like Polaris razors. Oh, and, cool. Uh, I mean, they looked amazing. They it, it's awesome. Movies, are, movies are fun. I mean, OK, my my part of the movie is probably a lot different uh, fun factor yeah. than your part of the movie. Um, we get different things out of it, but for me, the 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 difference from my normal job is that you get to crash on purpose. You get to drive uh, almost like the care, maybe like the character might. Sure. Um, like a little sloppy, a little test the limits. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like like in Tokyo Drift, as uh, you know, the the hero there is learning to drive, and then the bad guy is always just cocky and good. Mm -hmm. And um, that that kind of technical driving is so fun. I like the crashes sometimes too. If they're really big crashes, you get a bona fide real stunt guy in there who's made a brick, and they just huck it in. And um, there's uh, and they're um, you know that's like they're one stop shops. You know, in yeah. stunt in stunts, most of those guys can you know light themselves on fire they're martial artists they can jump off buildings they can scuba dive skydive you know they're like one-stop shops yep but it's hard to get real training in motorsport uh, without all that kind of financial or whatever yeah. backing of racing you've had way over your ten thousand hour yeah you get you yeah know. you get that kind of training yeah. as a racer <clears throat> and so that did open up for a time a window for 
some race drivers to come in or drift drivers to come in and do stunt work do just that thing and then when there's the big crash you get the real stunt guy in there to go sure. you know, do the deed and people don't know like it's really dangerous it, it, tell there was a i think there was two stunt drivers that died last year right yeah the, <clears throat> it, it, you know you don't hear about all of them but yeah it does happen even just on one film there was two yeah um, which film was that uh, that was a bond film a couple iterations ago i don't it was the one with the jag okay <laughs> it that's was crazy the, i mean that's yeah, a and a and a and a, a woman uh uh, uh a motorcycle uh, driver, I, th I believe, uh, died last year. I can't remember what TV show it was on. I can't remember. I remember hearing about that though. Yeah, and there's <clears> bad <throat> crashes. I mean, there's it. It is. It's it, it's super dangerous, and and they take all the precautions they they can. Yep. But as you know, I mean, the nature of the beast. That's and it's same in racing. So sometimes you, it it's it's just going to be limits. dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some of the some of the stunts are um you know the, te the the it's very old school and you don't need you don't need to be super dangerous on a lot of them because they're going to there's you know they call it movie magic or whatever you always like to try things practically yeah. and do them for real yeah. instead of all CGI but there's you know it's the art of you know directing and all that to make to make stuff uh, perce make perceived speed, <laughs> make stuff perceived danger, make things more dangerous than it is, so you don't necessarily have to die to do it. Yeah. Oh. Um, now we share something in common. Not a race car driver, but I am a pilot, and I hear you're a pilot. Oh man, I love it. When did you start? Uh, so we stopped shooting Top Gear two years ago, mm -hmm. and the day after last production day, I started on my license. So that would have been two years ago. Awesome. Yeah. And you're you're flying a 172, 182. It's a Bonanza oh, F33, so it's a low wing, but some you know single yep. engine just like that. Yeah, and um, it's been great. You know, it's it's just like uh, it's sort of expanded my little world. Yep, a little bit. And to your uh, helicopters. Yep. Yeah, and I mean in the basin here in L.A. Yep. It, I believe me, I'm looking down. I see helicopter pads everywhere. I think do they <laughs> do the buildings have to have them for fire? Uh, I don't know if they have to have them. I don't think so. Um, they're everywhere. But yeah, I mean, there are everywhere. I know they're, I think they're probably serviced by, there's certain ones like Los Angeles County, I'm sure, services as, you know, you know, to, to be a medical helicopter place. It's actually much harder than you think, though, to, to get permission to mm. fly and land on these helipads. You can't just do it. You have to ha have a massive insurance policy. Uh, you know, you have to get permission by the building. Okay. Um, so it's it's not as, you know, you think about it like, oh, I can just go land anywhere I want to and it's going right. to be great. It doesn't really work like that. With planes, <clears> it's, <throat> it's uh, you know, I, uh, one of the reasons I did it is I feel like we might be the last generation that can just go do it. Sure. You know, just go find a guy who's an instructor and rent a plane and get a license and then go fly around. Yep. Like I just don't, I mean, shit, we might be the last generation of drivers. Mm -hmm. So Maybe. much less, you know, people going up in the air and flying over cities. Yeah. So it, it just felt like it, you know, it may be a time in humanity where you have to do it. Yeah. And um, with planes, it's pretty easy. Like this morning I flew to Santa Monica yep. and you just get in the air and, and you know you tell them where you're going and and uh, it's a busy airspace but yep. there's all these little tunnels you can fly through and all this stuff so you can avoid all the big jets everywhere and yep. just come in and you know tell them you want to land and you land and uh, it it's um, I mean it's pretty amazing and especially in the desert I've never really flown on the East Coast mm -hmm. but in the desert out here where all the military stuff was in the 50s and 60s there's little runways everywhere sure I, with the uber driver on the way over here we were counting them up because oh, really? he'd never seen Santa Monica and I think there's 18 runways in the LA basin yeah and uh, it all through California and and like uh, the thing is like when I go to my mom's house in Monterey you know, there's three airports closer to her house than the Monterey airport. So you can just, you know, pull up pretty close, usually. Yeah. Not land right outside in the yard, but like maybe you can with a helicopter in some parts yeah. of the country. But no, you, you, and you definitely can. You you can, you know, if you have permission and you're not going to piss off neighbors, it's really sort of a gray area of who you piss off or not. That's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's sort of the, the term that's again. really, the, I mean, that really is sort of the gray area of it all. Um, it's been a great thing, though. It's been it, it, I, 
you know, like I've had to relearn the driving thing over and over. You yep. don't think of that. Uh, because a lot of these drivers, they get an IndyCar and they're in IndyCar for a long, long time, right? Um, and they have to relearn some things as the tire manufacturer changes or the aero package changes. They have to relearn some stuff. For me, we had the tires changed with Rallycross, you know, going from, from drifting to Rallycross. And uh, it basically had to start over. And I yeah. was like middle of the pack the first year and was like, what the hell's going on? I really want to, you know, I, it, it's not, it's just not as much fun. And... Um, and so just, you know, I had to go back to basics, get back into carding, like literally start carding and, and um, learn that kind of stuff and get hungry uh, to, to learn it in order to learn at the right rate. And flight school, I hadn't felt that in a while mm -hmm. where, you know, there's so much studying for so the much. license and for the instrument rating and all that stuff. And you, um, I mean, you have to literally have that mindset of, okay, I, I can't wait to get home because I got like two hours. I can sit and read this or I'll watch videos of that or whatever. Yep. And you yep. just crave to, to stick that stuff in your brain. And um, and there's no real competition there except with yourself. Totally with yourself. Yeah. yeah. And that's a, that was a nice little battle. And it still is. The learning on being a pilot, I mean, the, the, the goal is to, to grow older and not die doing it, right? Yep. So. Absolutely. Tremendous responsibility, you know, because it, it's – it's a very fun and free thing, but it's also you got to remember every time you're up there. I just want to go fly around clouds and do Miami Vice or whatever, uh, you know, Magnum PI helicopter fly along the cliffs oh, yeah. and water spraying on the windshield. <laughs> and that stuff is sketchy. Sketchy. Yeah. Sketchy. Sketchy. <laughs> it's like it, we can go to Catalina from here. You know, if you've, you've flown over there, I'm yep. sure from here and it's gorgeous to cruise around the island over there. But it's definitely not like, the, you know, the stunt pilots that were doing all the movies and TV shows making it look easy. Yeah. Yeah, you'll you'll really like I don't know if you've done any time right had any time on the stick in a helicopter but uh especially the map of the earth flying it's it's really fun. It's just it's a really fun uh I started in a in a 182 or 172. Yep. So you have a fixed have, wing also? <clears throat> I don't have my oh. fixed wing. I I probably have like 20 something hours and yep. then I just sort of I kind of stopped in my early 20s and then I came back and I uh, I started you know flying a helicopter and I, I, I kind of got hooked I was like oh this is this is more fun yeah um, more expensive yeah um, but uh, but really fun you'll, you'll you'll go into that next probably and you'll it like was yeah I, I think a seaplane would be fun too seaplanes cool yeah the um, I, I took a ride in a helicopter as a friend he just got his license I didn't know that oh, it was geez. like an R4 22 little bubble yeah four, four, four seats or two two seats yeah 22 yeah a little robinson yep. right there which are made i think here in torrance, yep, torrance. Uh, we were in colorado we're at altitude didn't know that that thing was like breathing as hard as it possibly could just to get off the ground oh yeah so there, there was a little bit of ignorance on my part getting sure. into the thing um got into my buddy love him david leach sorry to throw you under the bus but we get in there <laughs> the director yeah <laughs> no no and we uh we get out there and you know fire the thing up it's shaking around you're like whoa there's a lot of vibration in this thing you know you're wobbling around everywhere and then once you get off the ground it's just because it's just so lightweight you know yeah. every little puff of wind is blowing this thing around and uh, i thought we were augering in the car and then there's a building and then there's a mountain behind us and we're just sort of like wobbling around just to get out of the way of everything and uh, different story with a big, heavy, fast helicopter with some power. I'm sure much different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you and so what are you flying? Are you you have something? I'm flying here? the 44. Yes, um, <clears throat> most days. Uh, but I've you know got some time in the Bell and yeah. you know ultimately that's what I want to fly. Is the, that the, the turbine? Ranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turbines are they're they're a better helicopter. There was a movie Need for Speed, which was uh, a couple years ago, and in the video game there's always like a police helicopter chasing you. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. like in the video game, you're running from the cops. Yep. And so in the movie, they had to shoot the police helicopter chasing the whole sequence. And we're shooting in Modesto and some in Atlanta, but out on PCH in Modesto, there's just uh, you know a lot of mountains and everything. And so there's a camera helicopter shooting the movie helicopter chasing the supercar going 100 plus miles an hour. Sure. And it was the most impressive flying ever that, mm -hmm. that I've seen this this helicopter had to be right on top of the action I mean the blades were like right off the top of the car Oof. and then this camera helicopter right in the action so the guy in this guy Rick I can't remember his last name in the police helicopter in the movie 
um, you know, had nowhere to go. There's like no escape for anything, and he's just packed in. Some of those cars, if you remember from films you shot where you have sometimes, I don't know if you've ever worked with them, but they'll be like a driver on the roof of the car. Yep. And so some of those, I'm like in a cage uh, on a roof, and this police helicopter blades, I mean, I swear I could spit on them oh, almost. I ha- you can't see them, but yeah. I know it is angle and where he is right there. And uh, so that, I mean, the trust and everything is so incredible. And those guys, I think, are usually from Vietnam and they're, they have so many thousands so many of hours. hours. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just second nature for them. Yeah. Uh, it is an awesome thing. No, most most of the really great pilots, <clears throat> guy, in fact, one of the guys who, who, you know, gave me my license and I went through his training, he was, he was a Vietnam pilot. Um, they just, they put themselves, you know, they, they went through the paces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think actually, uh, and I haven't seen it, but in the new uh, Mission Impossible franchise, there's an incredible helicopter scene where Tom Cruise is flying. Nice. Um, and he's he's flying solo and he's... Uh, there, you know, he's acting while flying in this sort of map of the earth flying, coming through these, it looks like canyons in Scotland or something, and it's just wild. So is that map of the earth is <clears> when <throat> you're like right on the ground? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty bitchin'. That sounds pretty bitchin'. It's, it's scary to me, okay? Because, okay, so my daughter's 12. Yep. And um, it's scary because... You know, her friends and I mean, I've known this, I remember like three years ago, this poll coming out, the kids would rather have a new phone than get a driver's license when they turn 16. Oh, geez. And this, like what we were talking about, this responsibility that you have for yourself and the people beneath you and just all the people that you take care of or that are in your life, Mm -hmm. you actually have that responsibility in your hand, holding the stick, flying around through the trees. Um I, and they want I, new cell phones. I'm really afraid that's going away. They're oh, yeah. not even taking responsibility for getting themselves from A to B <clears> in a car <throat> and don't have don't see a need for it. Yeah. Right? They don't really even see a need to get out of the house and get out of the phone or whatever. My daughter's great about this. I'm not throwing her under the bus. But I see like kids that age yeah. and older um, that are uh, just absolutely absorbed with um, kind of not social you know, I don't know what it's called, social isolation or whatever it is, where they're just literally just stuck in a in a phone in order to be social rather than physically taking themselves somewhere, taking responsibility of where they are and, and their freedom of going somewhere. Yeah. Well, people don't realize, too, I mean, I, I, driving has got to be the most dangerous thing we do on a day-to-day basis, right? Just being on the freeways, being in a metal box, going at high speeds with other people around you. 100%. And, you know, you see people with their heads down on these phones, and you're like, you mother. Fucker. It's not, it's just not ever, it, it, it's, it, it's, okay, so you talk about it being adrenaline junkie. I'm yep. safer ripping around in my 600 horsepower VW rallycross car, jumping jumps and crashing into yeah. people than on the 405 ever. Oh, 100%. Any day of the week. 100%. You're, you're, you know, you're trusting the rest of society to be responsible in those moments, and they're just not. Yeah. And, and they, they, it's so it, the the barrier to entry to drive is so easy, right? I mean, it's fairly easy to go get a driver's license. Totally. And you really, you know, you're you're left at your own free will to make, you know, responsible driving decisions to either drive defensively or not. Yeah, um, yeah it's terrible. I actually, <clears throat> I've lost you know a couple friends to to driving accidents. Yeah. Um, but I lost a girlfriend to uh, to a driving accident on the four hundred five. And you know it, it's um, it's so it's so real. People just forget it every day because they're just doing it because it's part of their daily their daily lives. It's and, you know <coughs> and cars have to be made convenient, yeah. right? I mean you you shouldn't have to put a fire suit on and a fi- and a five point harness to yeah. to get in with a roll cage and everything to cruise down the highway. But um, I also don't think automated driving is the an answer right away. It's inevitable. Yeah, down the road. But I don't um, think we're there yet. No. And there's there's still the in the gray area is gonna be sketchy. Super sketchy. I don't um, want to be a part of the gray area. There no, I don't either. Yeah. And I don't want my kids to. And it's a it's a it's a it seems like in this gray area that we're really in already, it's a factor of training. Yeah. And and that involves taking your responsibility as a human being on the planet seriously. And that your what you put in your tool bag, your driving tool bag or your skill set is critical for your life and for the people you're carrying and people around you. Hundred percent. I have a this asshole buddy who's 
you know, got a Tesla and he is like this tech guy and he, he's just drive. he's, he's putting it on cruise control and just like breeding. And yeah. I'm like, you motherfucker, <laughs> yeah, you awful. are putting everyone in danger. I heard a Tesla just crash the other day. Just another, another one crashed the other day. And this isn't like me bashing Tesla. Like I think, I think it's really, it's awesome what they're trying to do. Like, yeah. I think the, the, you know, ultimately if we can get automated driving great and everybody's doing it, then it can take out, you know, the, the, the room for air of people being stupid or falling asleep or whatever, you know, ultimately <clears throat> at the, at the end of the line, it's going to be safer. Yeah. But there's the, there's still an element of, of taking responsibility of your own performance as a human being. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, you know, in Tesla's, for example, like they, they have some safety systems where you, you've got to have a hand on the wheel every once in a while. So sure. like you see that in other auto manufacturers. And I mean, it had to have been two days before people realized if you just take like a rag and hang it from the steering wheel, the car will always think that your hand's on the wheel. Oh my God. Yeah. And so Terrible. that way they Terrible. don't have to look up from the emails. <laughs> if you do this and you are listening, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Exactly. Oh my! The other gosh. side of that that's crazy is you can with this driver's license you can just go buy a 750 horsepower car and they're just like here you go I, have at it. I thought that would be a good business about 10 years ago doing driver training for like ah. athletes, professional athletes. Yeah, that you know just came out of getting rides to the court and now have a Lamborghini. Yeah, totally. And I thought the insurance companies would be all over that. It's not didn't go anywhere. Not so much. Yeah, that's a but, good idea though. That's a great idea. I rest, just got for it for the rest of us. <laughs> else. Well, I, I say that because I just got a, a, a Ford GT Yo. and I'm scared to death of it. Oh, no. Let's go for a ride. <laughs> That's what I well, told I mean, him. I was like, we got to get Tanner out to the track. <laughs> I mean, I want to drive it. I'm, I'm going to drive it. It's just I have a healthy respect for it because I know well, then that. You're, you're two steps ahead already. Yeah. Nice. But I mean, that, that comes with, you know, my piloting and, and knowing, you know what people do on the on the highway and, and how quick things can change but and that's that's actually that's that's it that's, yeah, that's, that's my gorgeous. baby yeah the one of the first cars i drove on a racetrack was an original gt40 oh no ways it was um spectacular i, I was a mechanic and just uh -huh. drove it around but it was uh sexiest car ever so i was really stoked when they released the next one and then this one yeah have you you have you driven the press car i sure? haven't you I haven't ha driven no, it? No, I haven't. We stopped shooting Top Gear right when that came out, uh -oh. and I left Ford right when they internally were saying that they were going to be building this, and it's like, okay. Uh -huh. yeah, but, well, uh, well, I'll let you drive mine. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, there was a show we did with a uh, Ferrari F12, and it was, um, you know, the show was going to be about how Ferraris were like all toned down now because they had all this traction control and all that kind of stuff. And thankfully, we ended up completely redoing the point of the show. Um, and, a, you know, with the car and it's like this also, you've got all kinds of traction control and things like that. But you got this dial and the way that I interpreted it really that made sense the most to me anyway was that this dial is basically how much a adrenaline you can handle and um you know when the traction control is completely on if you go out there and you just get through a corner you see the straightaway and you just mash the gas um the car will kill you like it'll it'll kill you oh quick. there will be definitely people who right? will die in this car probably right and um if you take the traction the stability control <laughs> off you know so it doesn't fix skids for you but it will maybe still not let the tires smoke um, then you have to have a little more discipline and be a little bit uh, better at dealing with the emotion that the car is giving you. These cars, what they do, the sound, especially the Ferrari, the sound, the feeling, everything about them and your your Ford here, it gives you an emotion that gets you excited about the whole process that's happening that yeah. will make most people kill themselves. Yeah. So it's just like any drug. Sure. You can take it to the point of ODing and you're done. And so this little dial is just a little bit of how much you can take. And if you turn everything off then you need to be pretty experienced at dealing with that much of that emotion and being able to suppress the adrenaline um, to get the most out of the car without it killing you. And it's um, when you get to that point with these cars, they're, they are supercars. I mean, they, it's, it's such a rewarding thing. Yeah. And it is such an awesome thing to take. A, you feel every engineering decision. You feel all this low center gravity and the carbon fiber and all the fancy stuff. You feel it all working once you get to the point where you can turn all the electronics off and harness every bit of it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, oh man, 
it's it's pretty wild. It's it is. What color is it? More importantly, it's is red. <laughs> it's, the, it's the click on it. Click on it, Tim. It's the red heritage right there. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. It's um. Uh, yeah. It's That's pretty. Yeah. It is. It's beautiful. And where are you going to take it? Well, uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm trying to figure that out first, but I would like to drive uh, some some good roads uh, around here. Um, it's based here in L.A.? Um, it's uh, it's in Montana, actually. When's it coming? Current moment. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to schedule some, some track days um, with it maybe and, and, you know, get it out there and kind of open it up. Yeah, I yeah. think, uh, I mean, I... I have a motorcycle, as you probably do, but I've never done a track day on a bike. Okay. And I feel like I'm at such a disadvantage on the road because, and I'm, I never grew up racing bikes or anything like sure. that. But, um, to, to feel the limits first. Yeah. And then understand the car. Yeah. Then, yeah. then you're better off everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So what, what is your daily driver? Um, I, uh, it changes a little bit, mm -hmm. but, um, I'm a Porsche fan. Grew up a Porsche fan. Okay. Uh, my dad had a when I turned three, and my parents got divorced. He bought a '76 912. Is, is that your Porsche right there? The uh, the that's a 914 in it. That's a 914. That's from a Top Gear show. Oh, okay. Um, a nine twelve. It's a nine twelve V. Thanks. Appreciate. It. I was a car. I was a car salesman. <laughs> a car Again, salesman. a salesman. Like a car yeah. Salesman, it? I was terrible. Actually, uh, I was now, the only one that sold a car. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, tropical tie. We we each had to uh, <laughs> let's talk about this tie. <laughs> let's talk, uh, that is a Jerry Garcia tie. Ah, I see. <laughs> you know, Makes I sense. Don't, don't mess yeah. around. <laughs> no, no. Got to close that deal. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I I hired two promo models to come in and close the deal for me. That was my secret weapon. Uh, Everybody had a secret that works weapon. well. Yes, typically. So you drive a Porsche. Uh, yeah, I've got a, a GT3 that oh, um, we had car. also in Top Gear that I absolutely loved and went out and found one. Um, and that's what are those go for right now? I was trying to find one that, um, like the one you have. Let's say the one that I have is a 2015, and uh, they they vary. So that that was that was my yellow car, the little 912 right there. Okay, that's a that's what I grew up with in the garage, you know. And I had to mow the lawn, and I had to move that out of the way at least ten times back and forth, revving the engine and stuff. Um, it's still have the, it. I still have it. Nice. Yep. Bought it off him and, uh, probably 15 years ago. Nice. Uh, it's, uh, it's in my house. It's actually on the second floor of my house on a lift. Oh, wow. It, it turned into a little bit of a shrine, which it wasn't the intent. It was mainly to find additional parking in a tight <laughs> lot. But just put it in the second floor of your house. It's like yeah. on display, isn't it? It's creative it's glass pretty much. or something. Yeah. Is it online or do we not want to go there? Uh, I don't think it's online, but. It's going to stock his house and yeah, life. That's, that's great, Tim. What's going on now? <laughs> yeah, post his address. Why oh, not? Oh, there it is. Yep. Look at that. Oh, no ways. Um, but there's a, uh, it's like one of the slowest Porsches probably ever made. <laughs> um, you know, four cylinder, but with the full 911 body. So it's sure. not the lightest. Um, but also, uh, you know, racing for Volkswagen, I'm fortunate to kind of get back into, I grew up with Volkswagens in the family and I just didn't remember that I had that. Kind yeah. of interest, and so I've started working for the R Group, which is um, their racing division. Uh, it's like their performance division, and so they they've got a lot of cult cars that have come out, and they have the R Golf, and then hopefully in the future they'll have a bunch more R stuff. This guy Yost Capito that I used to work with the motorsport and Ford Motorsport in the past took that over. Okay. Uh, he came from McLaren Formula One and and went to the R Group. And I think he's going to do great things with it. So, so you drive a golf. Yeah, got a golf R. Got a what is the e golf? What, what is a, the golf R? How is the golf R different than? Or what have you done to your golf R? So fifteen fifty two wheels, and we're doing suspension now. And then um, they also there's a company called Mount Tune, which is a tuning company. Okay. That I do stuff with. They do intakes and um, exhaust. So just basic stuff. That's it yeah, right there. Lots of GoPro cameras. Yes, all lots over of GoPro. Yeah, like that. One. Uh -huh. Can you slide that thing? Like on your daily, um, that daily one drive we did. to the G the, the Golf R, yeah, you can turn all the stability control off. There, nice. I had one car as a '68 Camaro mm -hmm. that um, was in a move was in the Need for Speed movie. Actually, oh, okay. there were the the only like movie cars that I that were actually I think drivable on the street. They were really good. You know, most movie cars are good yeah. for a take and then done. Oh yeah, done. Um, but this was they were built on like brand new cars, but with a '68 body. Okay, and. That one I had to sell. It had full drift 
everything. Like it was built as a drift car and it was just, it just wanted to be sideways everywhere. I like that. Yeah. And so on ramps were an interesting thing. But uh, yeah, so I've got uh, one of each of the Volkswagen lineup, the Atlas and the uh, E-Golf, which actually I was surprised I've used actually quite a bit. Okay. Because, you know, you drive it around the beach. It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I still have a Ford Raptor left over from the Ford days. Oh, yeah. I got one of those. Yeah. That's sort of, I've been toggling between that and another car I drive and a BMW, but uh, that's, I sort of flip between those as my yeah. daily driver. Yeah. I I yeah. I don't have very much parking at my house, so I sort of piss off my neighbors. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. It's like you landing a helicopter probably at yeah. your neighbor's house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just have a, a, a used car farm. <laughs> that's everywhere. cool. That's cool. What would be your dream car? If money wasn't, if you didn't, you could get whatever car you wanted. You had to pick one car. Um, to daily drive? Mm, no, it doesn't have to be to daily drive. Um, I am a big fan of the Carrera GT. I yep. still am. I, I know that it's got some bad history here, but uh, I, I've been I've spent a lot of time in that car. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm kind of lucky. I think the GT3 is is one of my dream cars, and I sort of get to have that. It's awesome. Which is uh, um, amazing. I wouldn't mind the manual version, which just came out. Wow. Some of the German engineers were flipping over, you know, in their graves or ones that aren't around. But be just because the whole idea of the nostalgia that the U.S. market wanted an old manual gearbox. Yep. You know, it's heavier and slower and less reliable and all that stuff. But sure. we had to have it and it sells like hotcakes over here. But I love to drive them. Mm -hmm. You know, the Golf R that I have now is manual. And uh, what about favorite classic car? Um, well, uh, that the reason I did pick up that Camaro is that I just like the shape of that. I would say a Boss 302 Mustang or a 68 Camaro. Just pull up a 68 Camaro. Pony cars, so yeah. Pull up a 68 they're, Camaro. They're, they're pretty fucking nice. There's just something sexy. They're small. You like the Camaros better than like the fastbacks than the. Um, yeah, that was mine right there, actually. Which one? Uh, that green with the white stripe. That means that was yours? Uh, that one looks like it. No, the one with the white stripe on the front. Uh, yeah, one. that one. Mm, that's the exact car. Mine was probably painted as a replica of that. Mm, I see. Yeah, there might rest, be... Resto mod? Or... <clears throat> what it do you was think? a resto mod. What yeah. do you think about the, the, the 68 Camaro versus the, the, the Fastback? The Mustang Fastback? Mustang, yeah. Um, I like the Mustang. I like the Boss 302. Um, partly because, you know, when you look at nostalgia cars, they're all going to be kind of have terrible brakes. They're not going to turn that great. Sure. They're going to sound good, but it's almost like the Shitty story. AC. Yeah. Nothing's going to work. <laughs> yep. The reason just I think. rattles and squeaks. And just talking in talking about. about it here is that the reason I like the Boss 302 is I did this event with Parnelli Jones, who raced them then. And he got up at this charity event and he told the story of why they were called the School Bus Yellow you know, why the color was school bus yellow on the mm -hmm. Boss 302. And it was because, you know, the, they couldn't get on the magazine with the black one and, and they kept winning the championships and winning races. And the they went to the road and track guy and was like, what the hell? You put somebody else's car on and we win the race. And he's like, well, it's black. I can't take it. Oh, he's like, well, what color does my car have to be in order to get on the cover of your magazine? He's like, well, yellow would be nice. So they couldn't find a place open on Sunday except a school bus yard. They bought paint from the school bus yard and painted their car school bus yellow. And then they won the race and got on the cover of the magazine. And so <laughs> just good. like kind of getting the story from it, it's now I'm a fan. And, uh, and they, you know, they're awesome. I've only driven one, but, uh, yeah, the 302, the Boss 302, like what is 69 or something like that. So you're a Mustang fan. Oh, Mustang fan. I mean, I'm just a little impartial to them. I like the Camaros too, though. Why, why, uh, why the Mustang? I don't know. I like the lines. Pull it up. Pull up to 68 Fastback. I like the lines. I'll show you where I like the lines a lot. Like get a, get a, like, like a yeah, bullet. Pull, yeah, uh, yeah. Pull, like pull up, pull it up. Like, yeah, I like, I like the, I don't know. I like the clean line from the top front headlight back. Something about it. It's like a little more squared off than yep. the Camaro, yep. you know. But I don't know. I just I just always like the lines a little better. It I'll pull, just speaks to you. Pull yeah. up a Boss uh, 302 there. So you take this shape, which I do like this shape, mm -hmm. and then it um, gets on a little human growth hormone and turns just into that yellow one right there. HGH. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, that's bitching. 
Um, there, yeah, there's something a little meaty about those. Yeah, but they're fun to drive. Do you ever get to drive muscle cars? Uh, I mean, I've driven some sixty eights, and yeah. I've driven, you know, I've driven some cars, yeah. but not on a daily. Not really on a weekly or monthly either. I'm a fan of that era. You know, there was one <laughs> show I got to work on briefly. It was a real honor to work on it, but I was terrible uh, at it. it. I mean, maybe I filled my role, but it was the um, RM auctions. Okay. And, you know, it's these auctions, yeah. and, and they're generally pretty high-end stuff. Sure. And I worked on it with this guy, Ken Gross, who like writes the books on all these cars, Alan DeCadene, who has owned all of them. Uh, Mikhail Haggerty, who's uh, Haggerty Insurance, who insures all of them. So they all are like so embedded. And I just got to go there to be kind of the learning guy. But anyway, uh, learning about the era, uh, each of these cars and its significance in history. I mean, it really is um, a pretty it's every every uh, era, whether it's muscle car or the old coach built cars or whatever. They all have so much significance to American history. Yeah. And it's such it's been a cornerstone of the economy. We're really in this crazy transition now where people don't really care what the car feels like yeah. to drive. They care about the features in it, mm -hmm. which we've never been the best in the States at making the least expensive feature filled car. Sure. And so it's a it, it's a it's a pretty tricky time when, you know, we're trying to rely on Apple and Google and other things to carry that cornerstone instead sure. of the big three in Detroit. Sure. It is it, it like the muscle car movement in America, which you know, started in the '60s, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's my favorite, I think, movement. Uh, you know, for uh, like America, it's a true underdog story. You know, like we were, we didn't really have race cars. You know, we didn't have like muscle right. cars. We didn't have it. You know, it was like Europe sort of dominated the scene, and then you know, with Carroll Shelby and the whole, you know, his you know coming to to win Le Mans and develop the car. What's up, Matt? Boys? Yeah. Hey, what's going on, brother? What's we got the Matt Farrow right? walk in the building. Yeah. The car master. You want to hop in? Yeah. Do it. Is my mic on? No, not yet. But Tim can do that. Hi, He's got, does, does that, that say Haggerty? Yeah. Does that say Haggerty? It does. We were just it's talking Haggerty. about Haggerty. It's to remind me to do an integration every show. Oh, I was just literally talking about McKeel Haggerty right there. We did it for you. I like you. McKeel Haggerty. Yeah, he's a good guy. You hung out with him? Yeah, we did a Who's show together. Older? He is, by far. Is he? Oh, yeah. He wears it well. <laughs> Mikhail Haggerty looks like Sorry. he's probably in his Mikhail. 40s. How old is he really? I don't know. He looks I don't young. Know. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good cat. It was a show. It was a, um, an auction show. That's, but I, that's yes. I agree. We're water. talking muscle cars, which is perfect well, for you. We, we, Matt, we were talking, actually, before we were talking muscle cars, we were talking about dream cars, right? Dream cars. Well, first of all, Matt is a host of the Smoking Tire podcast. Yeah. Yeah. People so know he, who knows, he, is, Tim. he knows something about Maybe, I don't know. Maybe internet, not on Scott's podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. We have a mutually exclusive audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Dudes. Hey, dudes. I'm really glad that phone ringing isn't mine. <laughs> Tim. Jesus. Uh, so professional. So unprofessional. Tim. What a dick. I thought it was Worst. Tanner. What would be your dream car? My dream car is a McLaren F1. It's never going to happen, ever. I don't have, I'll never have $20 million or whatever it takes to. Have one of they those. They were just 1.4 like 10 years ago. <laughs> Leno really? bought one and bought his used in 1998 for 600, uh, 800,000. And I just, I just dropped name drop. I just hung out with Leno, and he was. We were talking about the story because we were talking about car insurance and uh, and taxes. And there was a, a luxury tax. Remember the luxury tax, five percent. Yes. yes. So he bought his McLaren secondhand. So there's no luxury tax on secondhand. Sure. But when he went to register it. The, and insure it. The value was eight hundred thousand, and they were like, "Luxury tax." And he's like, "No, no, no, it's second hand." He's like, "There's, there's no way. There's no such thing as a second, <laughs> second hand car that's eight hundred grand." <laughs> and, and he, and they wanted to like hold his reg to fight him. For this is the state of California, yeah, right? And he yeah, he said yeah, he yeah. paid him. He said he paid him fifty grand. Jeez. To, just to not. Because they would have held the car and impound until the thing was settled. They Crazy. did that, I believe, to raise money for the state several years ago when they were we had a deficit every Probably. year, and they were trying to figure out because California is actually, I think, the fifth largest economy. It was the sixth. It just went. It right? went to the fifth largest yeah. economy in the fucking world. Jesus, it, is. it yeah. went from number six to number five like yeah. two weeks ago, yeah. like recently. Yeah. yeah, and they just sort of back tax everybody. They're like, "Oh, you yeah. bought something here. Oh, you owe us five percent." Yeah. What? Well, now it they're doing other amazing. stuff. Now uh, I'm building a building up the road, and now they it's they make the private uh, business owners do the city's infrastructure for them. 
So like oh, I have to put in a do. city fire hydrant. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's not their responsibility. No, that's your. I guess you want to store some cars <laughs> because yeah. I want to store some cars. Yeah, exactly. And the the excuse was that the existing fire hydrant wasn't close enough, so I had to put fair. Okay. Mm. Well, the the way the way the place you would put one that would be closer, there's no water main at all. So they're like, okay, well you have to put one over where there is a water main. So I have to put in the second closest fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's not even on the same street. What? Really? No, it's on the same block. You're <laughs> kidding. No, that's it's ridiculous. But you want a building permit? You got to get one. Yeah. So. Yeah. No loop. But yeah, and we all feel bad for Jay Leno and his and his five percent luxury <laughs> tax on his yes. McLaren F1, right? I know. Did you fly up here, Tanner? Like a boss? Of course I did. Oh, like a boss. Like a boss. It took no. It was. A, it took a little while. It was like almost thirteen minutes. <laughs> from from John Wayne from <laughs> John really? Wayne to Santa Monica. Did it take longer to drive here from the Hawthorne Airport than to fly here? Uh, from? Yeah, it's about the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I like when he said he was gonna fly up this morning. I was like, I was like, that's kind of like the same amount of time I was driving at ten o'clock. I was like, it's just different though. Yeah. But it's way more fun. Oh, does it ultimately take exactly the same amount of time once when, you prep the plane? Yeah, and then- when I left the house, uh, it would Definitely. have, uh, yeah, it was about to the minute. Yeah. But I looked down and I saw bumper cars the whole way oh, up that's to 405. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah. so the satisfaction level of that commute is much higher. Yeah. Yeah. So it's true. At least true. you're not. And they're closing San Monica Airport, so you should fly there as much as you can. Yeah, got to get it in. Are they really? Yeah. Have they? Are they closing it? They've said that. 2020. Oh, yeah. 2028. Yeah, they're, they're shortening it already. They're shortening it in 2020. That's it. Yeah. And then they actually officially like close it. Is the shortening it to eliminate jets? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. Fuck those people in their jets. Try to Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Burbank. You, f- you feel bad for Santa Monica private jet owners? No. I can, mean, can you fly private out of LX? Yes. Yeah, yeah you can. I think, I've never. I think it's a huge pain in the ass. It's a pain. It's, it's on the other side. Yeah. Oh, okay. You go. You yeah. enter off Imperial Highway, and they're just like the entrances of those things underneath the 105 there. But Don't look, people who people who bought houses by the airport knew what they were doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like buying a house on a golf course and yeah. suing the country club when you get. And they're like, I don't want balls. any more planes yeah. here. What? I I wonder what it does. For, I don't even want to stir this pot, but I wonder what it does to bring money to that area. You know, it, to the economy, because you're because once a jet can come, then people yeah. from New York can come, yeah. or can come from anywhere in the country and internationally. Like you well, can fly from China to, to Santa, Santa Monica. Monica. Though, it's like, do those people come and then spend their money in Santa Monica, or, right, or do, do they, they go, then go to there? Beverly Hills and spend their money in Beverly Hills? Right. After? I think, from what I heard from the people who rent car storage space there there was like some middle management company that got a sweetheart deal from the city and then was like renting it out at a 20x to everybody else Uh, and the goal was for the city to push this middle management company out i gotcha so that was what all the the maneuvering was about i'm just bummed they closed a restaurant there there was it uh, good it was good. Really? Yeah, it was awesome. Was this the one they were selling whale out of in the back? Okay. Fuck off. That, no, really? I swear to God. Yeah. This was like a real story. Why did they close? <laughs> oh, because they were selling whale. Really? Was it good? Was I don't know. Good? I've never had whale. Some guy, right? Yeah, you I think that, this, that right? might have been the one. It might have been the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Whale in the back. I think it was like selling out of the trunk of his car. Awesome. Oh my gosh! Really? Like it, I mean, look, I, I you know how stories go. They like yeah. embellish I mean, that's, every time, I've, right? I bought regular meat out of the trunks of people's cars before. Have so. you really? Like yeah. Steak, like a good like. Good no, there was thing. actually a guy who drove around my neighborhood when I was living in Playa del Rey with like a pickup truck full of coolers of meat. He probably had a stand at the farmer's market as well. Sure, okay. And it seemed like he was like a rancher who would go yeah. door to door selling his meat. I actually I bought some. It was all right. We Whatever. we buy our uh, <laughs> we buy our steaks from um, like a you know a ranch out in El Centro, and we just get them delivered by the cart. So we get awesome. an actual slab of beef, and then we have to fillet. Oh ourselves. really? Yeah. Oh, and you f- just straight from the butcher. Yep. Oh, and then we malt awesome. meal them, freezer seal them, and they're great. Wow, and it's sad. and it's it ends up being way cheaper and way better. Yeah. Then yeah. You know, going to a grocery store. This dude cool. was fined five grand for uh, selling whale. Oh yeah, was that it? Two hundred hours of community grand. service and five grand, two years probation. <sighs> yeah, that's not so bad. Five grand. Yeah, 
I mean, he probably, he probably made a lot of money selling whale, right? You don't sell whale if it's not not worth money. Why, has whale ever been known to be good well, to eat, I though? I well, well, the Los the... Angeles Inuit population really seems Well, no, here's the thing, though. Here, here's the thing, right? So whale was one of like the biggest industries like let's in like iceland for example right for yeah. for for many 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 years okay because that's what they fished up there now obviously we know like you know whale maybe not be the best thing to fish and you know it's it, they're beautiful animals they're amazing i never want to eat whale but oh, yeah. Yeah. it is interesting to put certain significance on like one animal and say oh that's wrong Right, we're allowed to eat tuna. We're allowed to eat mahi mahi, but not you know you're telling like a country what they can or can't fish. It's funny because it's based out of our perce- like part of it. Okay, it's the numbers of them, but then also like our perception of how smart they are. Yep. Yeah, and cute, cuteness 100%. level. Yeah, yeah, they charming. Do the, the do, yeah, charming, and yeah. the breathing air thing. The yep. mammals. People are more sympathetic to mammals, probably. Definitely, Disney movies really probably have their. I can't imagine it tastes that good. Probably you not. don't call something blubber that's delicious. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't make it into no. soap and stuff. It sounds no. Is it a su- it's sushi, right? Yeah, sushi chef. Yeah, is, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Well, okay. long living fish. Well, maybe that's why they were that good. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Shit up. Just yeah. we're talking that about whale. What were you guys talking about before I barged into your show? Muscle cars. Yeah. Muscle cars. Mm. Haggerty. Haggerty. Thanks. Yeah. They'll, they'll appreciate that. <laughs> Got you. Classic Got you. cars. Man, you got any like you got, that? Do you, do you classics? Do you have any old cars? Uh, no, I just have the. Uh, I had I had a '62 uh, Cadillac. Oh, big uh, body. Yeah, nice boat. Nice drive the boat. Fins. Yeah, that's good. That's tasteful. No, it was cool. Does your old man have a Grand Torino? Uh, I don't <laughs> think he actually does. Really? No. Not a not a sentimental no, man when it comes to movie I, props. Nah, he has some old cars. He's got some. He's got some old uh, cars. Anything really cool? He's got a original Mini Cooper. Oh, that's cool. It's pretty bitchin'. It's not what I would. No, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> exactly <laughs> the opposite direction. <laughs> Tell me, he's got a fucking Union Jack on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a velvet shirt. No, he he's got an old jacket. like thirty nine <laughs> Ford. Okay, cool. Uh, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he drives. You'd be surprised. He drives actually a ninety one Crown Vic. Fuck that's off. It's an old swear to. <laughs> Like the best, drives, like best, best car, car ever. It's just gutted. It's like it was an old. It was an old stunt car for you know some yeah. of his movies. It runs forever. Yeah, it runs forever. Half a million miles. But that's yeah. just his car. No, I mean, look, he has a lot of. Does he cars. do something fun with that car, or does he, he just? I don't know. It's just it's parts of the house. He drives. Oh, he, he rotates right, but he's got a bunch of different cars. But gutted I love car. watching <laughs> him pull up to a restaurant and people turn their heads as Clint Eastwood walks out of this car, and they're like, oh. You know, because I think it's badass. You don't have to drive some, you know. Bro, that's so pimp. Yeah, <laughs> it's anti-pimp. It's yeah, it's cool. <laughs> you really what undersell you yourself. Cyclone as well. Up Cyclone or a typhoon? He had a typhoon. He's yeah. ahead. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, a typhoon is great. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're coming up. What's are they ha- coming back up? Oh yeah, Haggerty would say they are up. They're, they're over up. fifty on the index. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's really. some integration right yeah. there. Right? Yeah. People Wrong want show, the, ty- but the typhoons. Good are good. Yeah. The typhoons, typhoons are, are good. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I used to have one. Did you really? Oh I had a gosh. typhoon and, and cyclone. Yeah. They were all, yeah, they were awesome. The cyclone, cyclone was a pickup truck. The typhoon was the oh, SUV. Oh, the SUV. Right, right. And then there was the Marlboro edition cyclone that had the Targa roof. One of those just went for huge money at Barrett Jackson. Are those sketchy to drive? I mean, it was a crazy it was a boosted turbo. car, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a turbo. turbo. V6 turbo. Yeah. Um, it it was like uh, all-wheel drive. I think it was yeah. the first turbo all-wheel drive American vehicle. Yeah. But was. What was the... Like, because at the time, they were ludicrous was, numbers, right? right no, 500 it was a 0 to 60 car. It was, no, it was, right? it was like 300. But it was, it was a 300. A, it was a, but it was like 450 torque or something. Yeah. And with the four-wheel drive... What is the horsepower, Tim? Does it say right there? Horsepower mm-hmm. torque? Mm-hmm. Engine. Doesn't that, say. And that's like a minivan now. That's a yeah, minivan. Yeah, it's bullshit. Yeah, Here's a quarter mile in 14.1 at 95 miles an hour. But the three. all-wheel drive really so affects it, right? The, I mean, the it. big deal was the cover of the car and driver because it was faster 0 to 60 than the Ferrari 348. Yeah. Right. And the Ferrari 348 is not exactly a 0 to 60 car. Right. So it was like 5.5, five, you know, ver- and so they made a big deal out of it. They're not that fast today, but they're neat. But for the time. Hell yeah. Was bitching. yeah. Oh, and if you rolled up anywhere today in a 
clean typhoon. <laughs> Anyone one, in yeah. their 30s or 40s would be like, oh, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I should try to get back the the old one that I, I sold. I sold it to- Do you know where to find it? Yeah, I know who has it. He's like sort of part of our family, and I remember he needed a car, yes. and I was like, eh, you can have the car. I sold it. I think I sold it for like 10 grand or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of get it, but when I see that photo, I don't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> the same way that you just did. An S15. 80s excess is good. It really, is 80s. 80s excess is a, good, is a good thing for me. I like 80s excess. Yeah. I used to have problems with it, though. I remember that's why I got rid of it. It was the, the, the gear cable would always snap, so I'd... I'd be like in a parking lot and be in reverse and then I'd put it into drive and it would snap and I'd be like, uh, what do I do now? I can't let off the brake. <laughs> it's absolutely shocking. Yeah. <laughs> no, quali- yeah. they were not quality cars, but it's as a, as, a, as a representative of their time, you know? And also, fucking all SUVs are turbo and all-wheel drive now. That's a good thing. It's true. Right? Fair true story. So it was pioneering. It was. Yeah. 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 And it <laughs> and it also <laughs> ushered in the era of fast pickup trucks which we got throughout the 90s and early 2000s the li- F150 Lightning and then the sure. SRT Ram and you know fast pickup trucks were a thing for a minute they're fucking The stupid. Raptor, right? Well then they figured out that if we're going to make these things go fast they Let's should go fast off fast. road. Yeah. As opposed to going right. fast. Who wants a 150 mile an hour pickup truck? Like, what is that for? <laughs> I remember, the SRT 10 was sketchy. <laughs> yeah. it was, uh, I used to do these drifting demos with Samuel Ubinet <laughs> at the dealer. Like, you know, they don't come train the Dodge dealers, and then there was like this big drifting show afterwards, and we're drifting around these things, these trucks and Vipers. And it was like you were on a ski rack of a car <laughs> strapped in ski with a rack. steering wheel and ripping around in them. Because you're sitting up so high they're and basically loose. on a viper. Yeah, they're really loose. Yeah. And uh, the the fact that you're like six feet off the ground, the speed is like completely masked. Really? <laughs> I did like 120 miles an hour in one, and I felt like I was going about 75. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but at least you probably got to drive the stick ones, right? They yeah. made me do an automatic. And, okay. uh, that was the Nothing goes arm. worse with an automatic gearbox than a viper engine, I assure you. Mm. So what does the future hold for you, Tanner? Like I said, I'm basically retired now. Cause, We've uh, pretty much accomplished everything. You've been the top of the sport for, you know, multiple years. Yeah, I don't know. I like, I like, uh, <laughs> I like, the, I crave the next thing. You know, the rallycross. So uh, our rallycross series in the U.S. is done as of the end of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, by the is time really? this goes out, we'll have a new rallycross series. It's in the works right now. Is this the one that's in the arena? Yeah. That's like you can watch it. You don't have to. It's like what is it called? Global, rally cross. You, yeah, global rally cross. Global rally cross. Yeah. No, so that's rally. gone, but a European version. So, so in 2009, I started going to. I left drifting, went to Europe, started doing this rally cross stuff over there. Worked with my manager to bring it over here. Race of um, champions. Um, it was a different. No, they have different, real rally cross over there, Tim. They have like proper rally cross circuits. It's like a actual real thing in, over there in stadium though. But those are bigger, right? Uh, they've been doing it since '67, and you know, like, is it super? What's a motorcycle super motard? I can't remember mm-hmm. what they call it. You Where know, they do the tarmac and yeah. the dirt. Yeah. So it's those, like the enduro stuff. And so those tracks are everywhere. They they converted those to rally cross tracks like in the '70s, and so they're half pavement, half dirt. You know, uh, lots of undulations. Not usually like an actual stadium, but usually a, like a natural bowl where people are sitting on grass and stuff. Mm-hmm. But that series developed pretty quickly after IMG bought the promotional rights. And um, now it's called the World Championship. Uh, my manager started the series here in the U.S. called Global Rallycross, sold that. Um, that it dissolved as of the, earlier this year. And then all of the U.S. teams, the Andrettis and the... Um, I think uh, you know Travis uh, Pastrana and Ken Block and a lot of those other other guys that um, have been involved in rallycross are going to join a new U.S. series that is going to be announced here soon. Oh, that'll be exciting! Yeah, are the drivers cool. going to be involved in the running of the series? No, that's a bummer. Yeah, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? It is. I think it probably would be if if you could get everybody same place, same time. Yeah, but. Yeah, it's uh, but so the that schedule I think is going to be out here pretty soon. It's, and you are going to race in that? Yeah, going to race in that. Some more in Europe also. Um, I could see doing some more rallycross in Europe in the future. I could see doing more road racing. VW is now involved in the Pirelli World Challenge. Okay, maybe doing some of the TCR stuff. And what then, cars are they running in World Challenge? GTIs. It's a, 
Golf, yeah. Oh, okay. They're badass, actually. If you pull up a TCI, uh, TCR Golf What's, there. Are they two liter? Uh, yep. But they're just like, you know, super light, super sticky. and. You just wait until you see these things. Look how mean that little bastard uh, that's is. That's actually a cool little livery on that one. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Is it? A, it's five doors? They're all five. Oh, they killed the three door, didn't they? Yeah, they're they all did. five door now. That looks real. All, can you zoom in, Tim? Mm-hmm. Make yeah. it big and far away. Wow. Yeah, they're mean. And that's GT, GTI is not ours, huh? Wow. GTI should be R. Should be R, right? Yeah. But the R's are all wheel drive. Yeah. This is a front wheel drive car. Yeah, so that's a front wheel drive car. Cool. Um, but there's uh, well, so like maybe fun. some more road racing. How um, long? How long can? What is the age of a? That's an a good old question. Driver, that's a good know? question. I mean, Scott Pruitt still does it, bro. How Randy many years Pope's you got is left at the top of his game right now, and he's like sixty. 60 and still yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Newman won his last race at 83. Jesus. He won he wanted Lime Rock in a GT1 Corvette at Mother 83. Pearl. Wow. Yeah. And died wow. a year right, Tanner, so you're not retired yet. Yeah, so I got three more years. <laughs> you got three more years to 80. Yeah. <laughs> Old bastard. Yeah. No, I still do some videos. We're going to do some more of these, like Quantum. You remember that show, Quantum 80s Child here? Remember Quantum, Quantum Drift? Or quantum, quantum leap. Quantum leap. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. Just did a new video we called Quantum Drift, Is that which the- was uh, like, you know, leaping from car to car kind of a thing. You, you have to make these weird content videos yeah, as a sure. race car driver these days, right? Sure. So, Hashtag branding. Yeah. So we'll do some more of those. I mean, and at least you got stuff. Volkswagen to like, and Rockstar and whoever to spend money on that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's better yeah. than grinding it out at the bottom what yeah. I do. <laughs> for sure. What was the you one? What was the one video in San Francisco? Uh, that was Ken's uh, fourth one, I think. So, the Jim Connor four. Yeah, yeah, I think it was the fourth one or fifth Maybe one. Four or five. That and, was bitching. Yeah, that was cool. That was some cool content. His deal is, uh, you know, with Scotto is his like uh, director of cre everything. Hoonigrin brand director. You know Brian Scotto. Yeah. The tall guy. He's like six foot six. He his deal with with Ken is he loves shutting down really Cities. hard to shut down locations. Yeah. So like he just wants to find the next hardest thing to get a car on and flying through the air. For people who don't know, it was a pretty much a drift video through San Francisco. Yeah. And it was awesome. Yeah. What well, how do you, how do they find it if they look on YouTube? Jim Connor. Ken Block Jim Connor yeah. yeah. one through ten. Yeah. Totally I totally wanted, cool. I wanted to do city. San Francisco. Pretty Ooh. bad. Ken once he did it, it's done. Sure. Well, remember, I remember you did the Mulholland thing, which I was there to see. Yeah. Great oh, yeah. fun. Mulholland drift. Yeah. Those I mean we did that whole video for fifteen grand. I know it's awesome, but yeah, you, you the the best part of that video is that you prided yourself on doing it the first time. The road had to be clean, whereas you right. could see the tracks for multiple takes in the Jim Connolly, which fine, that's that's how movies work. But doing it that way, but you didn't really stick with that very far. Like you could have done a series on like clean tarmac drifting, right? Right. Yeah, Maybe we that. it was going to be that. that. What happened is we changed manufacturers. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah, that yeah. Scion TC, yeah, which by yeah. the way is now back in my garage after 15 years. You bought it? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah, That's but that, so that one is, uh, yeah, that th- we went to a new manufacturer. We didn't have a drift car to continue that series. That is. Uh, yeah, that maybe we'll sense. strike that back you up. Probably. The facade. Yeah, I mean, I, they don't. Scion's dead. They, they don't own the concept <laughs> of, of drifting on clean roads. Bring it back with Volkswagen. Well, we have a Passat 900 horsepower Passat now yeah. that we just put back seats in for to make it a taxi. Yeah. Mm. And uh, which you should probably ride in that before you take your Ford GT out. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Drift taxis are really, really fun. I've been out with uh, Forsberg. And Have his you? Infin- yeah, hell yeah. Oh, I bet that was awesome. Do you know the, the grid life stuff? You've yeah. You've heard about that? Yeah, of course. You should get involved with that. It's really fun. It's so, really fun. It's I a little, like I'm, I'm laughing to myself. Grid life is this motorsports and music festival that I'm okay. involved in. Yeah. I do their announcing with uh, Jared DeAnda, the Formula Drift guy. And uh, all these drifters and racers come out and it's a whole, it's a music festival with all th- with, at a racetrack with racing. So there's girls there, Ooh, which is nice. rare. Yep. That you don't get that. <laughs> and uh, But all these drifters come out and while out because there's like, kind of like no rules and so they you know they'll run like 50 drift cars on the circuit at once and it's just like madness it's Chaos. super super fun so i'll be there in the midwest one and the one in atlanta oh awesome yeah with the passat great i uh can't go to the midwest one but i will see you in atlanta for sure nice i can't wait shotgun passat Boom. Drift laps road. <laughs> road atlanta is a crazy place to drift yeah i've been it's there a few huge times. Track. It's gonna be awesome love it because they drift full circuit yeah sorry 
hijacking. No, don't at all. I think <laughs> I mean, we're going to jump on your podcast next. So yeah, let's we're going like, to hit cut and then just we're going to hit cut yeah. and go on your deal. Um, it's going to be awesome. Tanner, thank you so much hey, my uh, pleasure. for thank giving you. all the listeners the 411 of what is going on with cars these days. Hey, thanks, brother. And doing something you love because that's pretty much amazing. Do it more while you more can. people need to do that. Do what you can. Go fly, go fly, go drive. Go, go do drive. Just do stuff. whatever you love and you'll make money at it. You'll figure out a way to make a living, right? You do what you love, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Grows, grows <laughs> right? a yeah. beard. Like a, huh? <laughs> Growing a beard? Growing yeah. a beard. That's it's more of a goatee. Not professionally. Yeah. Um, go, yeah, you, I drive cars for a living. I figured that out. You figured it out? Yes. You can, you, you can do it. You, you can get good at whatever an you love if you put enough time and energy to it. Yeah. You may have to do it until you don't like it anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> warning. <laughs> oh, warning. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah.